Um, hi, everyone. Hello, panelists. So my Hello. name is <laughs> I am the COO of the Tender Mercy Care Foundation, um, where we support women and children in Ghana with the basic needs of life, medical aid and education, specifically towards um, with a huge focus on virtual and augmented reality to children in villages, right? When we're thinking about that, I'm thinking about um, exposing and giving them access to the tools that they need to succeed. Um, so as Amber mentioned, our theme is closing the dream gap the value of role models and representation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going, I'm joined today by the leaders within the gender parity and equality space that span areas of focus, such as research, nonprofit organization, brands, and mentorships. So I'm gonna introduce our panelists so that we can jump in and hear their pathway. So again, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. So first we have Lisa McKnight. She serves as Senior Vice President and Global General Manager for Mattel's Barbie brand and Across Dolls. McKnight leads a global team that's focused on brand strategy, product development, and marketing execution for the iconic Barbie brand. <laughs> Welcome. Next, we have Andre Simpian. He studies cognitive development as well as gender and racial stereotypes that shape people's self-views, aspirations, and behaviors towards others. And Andre partnered with Barbie in a two-year-long research study to better understand what causes girls to develop self-limiting beliefs by the age of five, a phenomenon co coined the dream gap. Then we have Miriam Gonzalez Durantes, an international trade lawyer and the founder and chair of Inspiring Girls. Inspiring Girls International is a global charity dedicated to the raising, to raising the aspirations of young girls around the world by connecting schoolgirls to women role models. And a fun fact, we're both on the Dream Gap Advisory Council. So thanks for joining us today. Um, then we have um, Kat Jagai. Um, they are a writer, artist, and editor. Um, they have been involved with Girls Right Now since 2009 first as a mentee, then an intern, and now as a mentor. For 25 years, Girls Right Now has been breaking down barriers of gender, race, age, and poverty to mentor the next generation of writers and leaders. Kat also works in IP for Alloy Entertainment, a creative, a creative think tank and editorial partner that develops and produces original books, TV series, and films. So panelists, I'm so excited to hear from you guys as we discuss the impact of role models on breaking the bias. So with this, we are going to jump in. So I have one question that we're gonna start off for the panel and is gonna be targeted to Miriam first. As a young person, um, did you see people that look like you in a job that you currently have? Um, did you think having a career like yours was even possible? <laughs> well, not at all. I am now 53 and I was born in Spain as Spain was going from a dictatorship to a democracy. And I came from a small town, a village, uh, really in the right in the center of Spain. And it wasn't only that there were no women who did the kind of job that I wanted to do. There were not very many women who worked period. In fact, my mother, as one of the teachers in the village of secondary school, was one of the few women uh, working there. And I vividly remember what a big role it played in my childhood, mm -hmm. seeing my mother having to defend her right to work and, and to say that the fact that she was working had nothing to do with disrespecting my, my father. And then when I went to university, I very quickly, I, I studied law and I very quickly wanted to do international affairs and to be a diplomat. And, and I had, well, many women have faced this, you know, having a teacher telling you, well, that, that job is not really for women because you are not going to find a husband who is going to follow you around um, all over the world. But fast forward a few years and I, I was working in foreign affairs and there were not female ministers of foreign affairs. You know, the very few ones who were there, they all had power suits and stilettos and they, they read very rigidly whatever somebody gave to them. And, and suddenly one woman, a young woman, a foreign affairs minister of Sweden, Anna Lindt, one day walked in and she had shirts and trainers and she was young and she had a young family. 
And it was literally, you know, she talked normally. It was like, like a breath of fresh air coming in. And, and to me, that, that is the definition of a role model, somebody who really inspires you. Of course, I took inspiration from many men around me, but seeing somebody who was a woman like me and that was young like me, it made such a difference in, in my life. She's probably not aware or she has now died. She was assassinated, but, um, but she wasn't aware, I'm sure, of how important she was in my life. And I think that we all need to remember that we may have a huge impact on people, even if we don't know it. I agree. Thank you for sharing. And then I think with this, I'm going to turn it to Andre, right? Um, can we talk more about a little bit about representation in research, right? As a young person in research, like how was this for you? Um, can you share any barriers you face within your career path? Yeah, so I mean, um, I, I faced, um, even before we get to research, I was born in, in Eastern Europe. Um, and pretty early on, I realized I was gay. And in the 80s, uh, Eastern Europe wasn't uh, and still isn't a very um, gay friendly place. So uh, I don't know what possessed me, but I thought, you know, I'm getting out of here. Right. So even just the, 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 the process of trying to apply to colleges in the U.S. to have a better life for myself as a gay person in, in a place that won't stigmatize me for um, for who I love um, was what it was quite a journey insofar as you know the internet was just getting started there weren't that many resources that you could access and I had a young uh, woman who was a role model who my mom just happened to connect with her mom accidentally at a work function and she was Romanian and she was going to college in the U.S. and she essentially mentored me through the steps of applying to colleges in the U.S. and, um, you know, like what to fill in for all those financial forms that you have no clue like what to put for as a kid growing up in Romania. And um, I mean, that was one of the, my, the most powerful sort of role model experiences that I had growing up and so far as here's someone who was like me. Um, in the sense of someone who shares my national identity, I guess, uh, who had uh, sort of achieved an outcome that, uh, that I wanted to achieve. So that was, that was um, one experience I wanted to share. And of course, in research, um, LGBT individuals are underrepresented in, in STEM, um, as they are in many other um, careers that have to do with, with math and science and technology more generally. Um, and it was... Um, it was challenging, for example, when, when I was looking for mentors for graduate school or for when looking for a postdoc um, or for um, a recent, like a, an assistant professor position, not seeing other people like me when I went on visits to um, interview at various places, not being able to ask what it's like to be a gay person in this, in, uh, in this environment. Um, I mean, I ended up being lucky I ended up uh, finding a, com a supportive community but uh, along the way I wasn't sure if I would be able to get an academic job um, in an environment where I would feel um, comfortable being myself and um, um, anyway so that, that that was definitely an obstacle that I had to overcome along the way. Well thank you for sharing definitely. I'm gonna pivot to Kat and Kat do you think um, having a career like yours was possible. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, I didn't even know that IP existed when I was young. I actually didn't even, I graduated from college without knowing what IP was. So IP for people who don't know on the call stands for intellectual property. So we come up with basically story ideas for books, television, and film. And then we hire people to make that happen. Um, and as a kid, I was always written up for daydreaming and not paying attention to school. Um, and I had all these, you know, crazy pictures I would draw of the characters I was imagining. And if you told me, like, when I was young, um, yeah, you can just daydream all day and someone will pay you for it. <laughs> I would have not believed you. Um, and, you know, this is a job that uh, is perfect for me, but I had no idea existed when I was young. I came from an immigrant, typical immigrant family where you were supposed to be, you know, a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and I wanted to work on books. And I had to fight my family for that. I had to fight my community for that. Um, and then on top of that, I was queer and I was closeted. Um, and it was it was pretty hard. And then I got out of college and I didn't even really understand what a, an editor did. Like I knew I wanted to work on books and I had like written a lot of stuff, but I think I was thinking something more like a copy editor. Um, 
sort of someone who does like sort of structural edits and looking at plot and story wasn't even really something that I was conceptualizing. Um, and I applied to over like 300 publishing jobs. Nobody emailed me back. Um, and finally, I got uh, an internship through Girls Right Now at HMH, which is now Clarion. Um, and HMH did these lunch and learns with the interns. Um, and one of the editors there um, happened to work at Alloy. And as I listened to her talk about her career trajectory, I was like, oh, that, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. Um, but that I was like, what, 25 when that happened? So it took me a really long time to figure out that my dream job um, even existed. Thanks for sharing. And I know we didn't hear from Lisa and you serve, as I stated before, as the Senior Vice President and Global General Manager for Mattel. So let's talk about your journey. Um, what, did, what did representation look like? Well, thank you for, um, for having me and thank you for moderating and great to be with you all today. Um, and it's been a great day, by the way, kudos to the female quotient team. Always a big fan of these um, events. Um, you know, interestingly, I, I was fortunate in that I, I went to an all girls school um, for nine years. So at an early age, I was encouraged to um, believe that I could do anything um, I was empowered to do, um, you know, anything I wanted to do. I actually um, wanted to play soccer and our team didn't, our school didn't have a soccer team. So I was encouraged to join an all boys soccer team, which I did. Um, so that was all great. Um, but I will share that one of the struggles I had when I started working was when I became not only a, a, a worker and an employee, but also a new mom. I struggled with my motherhood identity. And I felt like at that time I needed to conceal it. Um, I was in a lot of meetings that were run by men. Um, and certainly the companies that I was working at at those periods were led by men. And um, you didn't talk about motherhood. You didn't talk about um, the humanity. Um, and you just sort of where yes, I can, and how high do you need me to jump and I'll jump. And, you know, I was happy to do it. I was ambitious and um, always loved what I was doing from a career standpoint, but it wasn't until later that I realized this is not sustainable and it's not good role modeling for this next generation. You know, we've, we've got to always remember that um, we're humans first and um, everyone's got a lot of stuff. We're multidimensional. And we're better at work when we can be authentic. So that was kind of my journey. Um, I'll give one little example. It was around Halloween. And um, many of us, if you live in Los Angeles, there's a lot of commuting. And you know, many of us, family members and, and parents wanna leave early on Halloween to get home and start prepping. Um, and I'll never forget when a meeting was called at 4.30 by um, an all-male team. And I had to be the one to sort of speak up and say, can we push this out a day? Um, because we're all doing family stuff. So one little example, but it was something that um, was kind of a pivotal moment. And I realized again, that I would be better for my team if I showed up as my authentic self. I love that. And even talking about your authentic self, right? Um, it's just important to show up fully. It's International Women's Day, right? We have to be dominant in the space that we're in, the spaces that we are in, and really make noise and, you know, be ourselves and be here. So now I'm going to pivot um, and kind of talk about this general topic um, when we're thinking about access. Um, due, to, due to many factors, girls are less likely to have opportunities to gain digital literacy. Um, think about ways children are facing barriers to access. How in your current positions are you helping pave the way for more young people to see themselves be represented, be represented and believe that they can do anything, right? So I'll throw it back to Lisa to hear your perspective on this. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, this, this is sort of the cornerstone of what we believe in, you know, with the Barbie brand. I mean, Barbie's purpose is to inspire the limitless potential in every girl and what we've realized in more recent years, and you know, big kudos to Andre and his team and the research that they've done that you know, uncovered this phenomenon called the dream gap, where starting at the age of five, 
girls start developing um, limiting beliefs that they can do and be anything. Um, and, and what we've realized with Barbie is that it's one thing to say you can be anything, but we have to do more and we have to come up with ways to remove barriers that are in girls' ways and or, as you're mentioning, give, make sure there's access for everybody. So again, we are doing a lot of things to what we call close the dream gap. In fact, we, again, have been partnering with Andre since 2018, and we officially created the Barbie Dream Gap Project to do just that. You know, we're, we're funding more research to, to understand the root causes of these barriers. We're, we're investing in curriculum to help educate kids and girls to um, overcome some of the challenges that they're facing. We're creating role model dolls of real women so girls can actually see that there are real people doing these amazing things. We're highlighting those women's stories, um, the good and the bad, because we also want kids to know that there's a journey that a lot of these amazing women have been on. And, you know, it's not an easy rise to the top or to wherever they are in their fields. Um, and, you know, there's challenges, but it's, it's all... Um, doable. We're doing a lot with Barbie herself as a role model, um, making sure that Barbie is in different careers where um, women are underrepresented. And again, it's all about partnerships. Um, and again, couldn't be more excited to be partnering with Miriam and inspiring girls. We've always said we can't do this alone. So we're trying to use the Barbie brand to shine a light on some of these opportunity areas where we can even the playing field for girls. Thank you so much for that. And you mentioned Miriam, so let's talk about inspiring girls. So talk us through role models and what that looks like. But if, if, if I may start by um, focusing on something that you said earlier, and it's that you spoke about digital literacy. Yeah. And I think in the, in the many years that I have spent now working with girls, I think that it is so important to frame it in that manner. You know, somehow I think that we, we exaggerate the divide between STEM and science and everything else. And something that we try to make girls understand is that digital literacy now is part of everything that you are going to need it no matter what, and that therefore it is not an option for you not to understand that language and what it can bring to whatever you end up doing in life. I think it was the previous panel that was talking about how early on boys and girls look at jobs, like jobs for women and jobs for men. And they mentioned the teenager years, and that is the, the age where we work until now, that because of the dream gap, we are going to start working with younger girls as well. But, but it is not really in the teenager years that they start looking at the world in that way. It's from age six, from age six. And what happens when they are teenagers is that they start dropping subjects and dropping um, sports as a consequence of everything that has been happening during those years. Now, sorting that out is as simple as making sure that they see how many women do your, those jobs and what are the practical things that they are doing with those jobs. It's not just to tell them, oh, well, you know, this woman is engineer or whatever. It's like, no, no, this is you know, what she does in life and how she helps her community. And this is why you should be interested in it. And we do it through a variety of means. We bring the role models to the schools. We uh, do it virtually through a video hub. We do workshops and we are going to be doing even more workshops now through the cooperation with the Dream Gap. Uh, but we also do it in social media. So basically we have to go wherever the girls are. But something essential is that all of us think about visibility. You know, a very simple way to help is visibility. I'm based current, currently in Silicon Valley and I despair at how little visibility there is for women in this world, in this digital world. It's just not good enough to be very good at your job. <laughs> you need to keep thinking, where can the girls see me? And what do you think that they will see? Would, would they see you behind your computer or in the scientific magazines? You know, where would they see you? And, 
and try to make yourself open to them. If you don't find another way to do it, come to us at Inspiring Girls and we will tell you how to do it. I love that. And thank you so much for emphasizing visibility, right? I work for Black Girls Code and one of our main things is how did we, how were we providing access to young girls of color so that they can see themselves as developers, so that they can see themselves as engineers and be okay to come into space not knowing anything, right? But saying, hey, we're, we're going to teach you. That's why we're here, right? We're teaching you how to be a boss. We're teaching you how to make that and disrupt the change. So I think that's really important. And I'm going to jump into Kat. As, um, Miriam talked about visibility, right? Can you talk a little bit about the importance of it um, in career paths, especially non-traditional settings sometimes? Yeah, um, I think a lot about this quote, you know, Diaz ha has where he says, um, if you want to make a human being into a monster, deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. Um, and growing up, I didn't see anyone who looked like me anywhere. I think Things have improved a lot since the 90s when you'd have like the token black kid, the token Asian kid, maybe if you were lucky, one Mexican kid <laughs> like on television. But I mean, it's 2022 and people still ask me, my father's from Guyana and people still ask me, oh, is that in Africa? Where is that? Um, so I mean, I on a professional level at this point, I've pretty much exclusively signed up um, BIPOC authors, mostly queer authors who otherwise wouldn't have had the connections to get into the publishing industry. Um, people I've met through books right now or through Cafe Conum, which is a black focused like poetry group in Brooklyn that's doing really amazing work um, or like slams, et cetera, which tend to be much more like black and Latina like focused. Um, but the publishing industry is so old school in many ways. I think it's like very much um, almost like a tradesman internship where, you know, you have to know somebody and then that person you work with for two years. And then eventually if you put your time in, you can, you know, get moved up. And I think that there are a lot of um, industries that have moved with the times. And I think in some ways publishing is sort of really languishing. Um, and so you look at the upper level management of publishing and it's almost all white men. Um, and you look at sort of the, the mid tier and it's almost all white women. And then you have actual diversity amongst the assistants and maybe some of the assistant editors. Um, so almost all of the people at my level that I know are you know, black and brown and queer, but I, there's nobody who looks like us at all in mid-level or upper, upper level senior management. Um, and it's it's hard. So, I mean, that I know that the industry is trying to change by hiring people sort of at that lower level, but also the jobs, you know, things narrow as you get to the top and people leave. And there's also a huge issue with the fact that publishing doesn't pay people well. And if you come from a background where you had to put yourself through college or you have to get money back to your parents or you know you're an immigrant and you're dealing with like all the various things that come with that as opposed to coming from economic privilege you can't work for thirty thousand dollars a year and wear a suit to work that's kind of ridiculous to expect that of people um so i guess to sort of transition to the work i do with girls right now which is all about opening doors for girls and gender expansive teens who just don't know what that what's available for them they don't know what's out there so they have these workshops that cover things like poetry, but also sort of less expected genres like songwriting and movie scripts, um, investigative research, just things that like young people who come from families where, you know, you are expected to have a more traditional career path, um, just things that you can think about. Um, and often, often these workshop leaders are BIPOC as well. And so these girls can sort of see, uh, I guess, future versions of themselves, hypotheticals that'll sort of help them expand the ability for them to think about what they can be in the future. Love that. Thank you for sharing. And when we're, when we're thinking about the diverse ways of storytelling, right, it's really important in, that we see different cultural aspects and different identities just emphasized during that time. So that's really important. And also Thank you can tell those stories authentically if you don't have mm -hmm. editors who are people of color and who can know. I mean, you saw that I'm, I'm sure several people in here have heard about the controversy around American Dirt and like this woman who didn't know what she was doing talking about it wasn't hers. I, I think that's a failure on the author, but that's also a huge failure in the fact, like who's in that room in the publishing house? Do they not have any Latina editors who could have said, hey, this is questionable. Like that to me speaks to the fact that the editorial team must be incredibly white. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
And then is I guess this is a way that I can jump into Andre, right? When we're thinking about research, right? And doing our due diligence to make sure the proper narratives are being taught, right? Um, when we're thinking about the Dream Gap project, um, talk a little bit about just your work in, in a sense of research in general, right? I wanna hear more about that and would love to share that with our audience. Of course, yeah. So more generally, I'm interested in the development of gender identities and gender stereotypes. How is it that children growing up in that culture are exposed to the messages that they're exposed to end up internalizing or rejecting some of these some of these messages? And how does that then relate to their um, career trajectories, to their educational trajectories, to the careers that they see as being for themselves or not for themselves? And one of the research projects that um, that we did along these lines, which is the project that kind of connected us with, with Barbie and with Lisa and her team, looked at gender stereotypes about brilliance, right? Brilliance, innate intellectual ability, you know, having intellectual firepower. It's something that is both incredibly vague, like what is that? Um, people think they know it when they see it, but they don't really know it when they see it, right? Um, and therefore is really um, rife with bias. Um, and also something that's really associated with some of the most high status careers in our society, if you think about scientists, if you think about, you know, like successful authors, successful artists, all of these people are supposed to be super brilliant, right? There, it's, not, it's not a matter of putting your nose down and, and working hard, at least in the popular conception. It's about having that, you know, God-given talent that you either have or don't have. And that is a problem because still in the 21st century in our society, we don't associate those intellectual gifts with women as much as we do with, with men, right? So just to give you an example, this is not my research, but um, another researcher had access to anonymous Google searches performed by American parents in the, 20, you know, in the 21st century. And parents are much more likely to Google things about their son's intellectual abilities. This is my son a genius. And conversely, much more likely cool things about their daughter's uh, physical attributes. Is my daughter overweight? Is my daughter ugly? I don't even know what you expect Google to tell you when you ask it, like what if your daughter is ugly. But this is what American parents, again, post the year 2000 in the privacy of their homes when they think no one's looking because you don't expect someone down the line to, you know, like uh, sort of tally what uh, searches you make about your kids. Um, this is what they're concerned about. This is the, the, what they value in their boys and their girls. So one of the things that we did is we, we tried to see how, uh, how early in development um, girls and boys internalize some of these beliefs that associate high level intellectual ability with men more than women. So, you know, working with kids is a bit of a challenge that, you know, like their vocabulary is not quite the same as that of an adult. We couldn't ask them, you know, who's brilliant, who's a genius, because a five-year-old wouldn't really understand that. So we had these stories that we told them about a person who's really, really smart, and this person can figure things out really quickly and better than everyone else. And we didn't give them any clues to the gender of this person. And then we simply asked them to play a guessing game where they, we showed them a bunch of pictures of adult men and women and said, well, if you had to take a guess, who do you think this person who's really, really smart is, right? Um, and then what we saw is that at the age of five, both boys and girls chose a majority of people of their own gender as being really, really smart. But already at the age of six, we saw a big drop in the extent to which girls chose women as being really, really smart. And also at the age of six and seven, we had in, in that particular study, girls were much less likely to choose members of their own gender as being really, really smart relative to, uh, relative to boys, right? So already it seems like at the age of six, you see the beginnings of the stereotype that associates brilliance with intellectual ability. And that's really important for us to know if you're trying to, intervene to change things to level the playing field by talking to college students or to people who are in graduate school or have their first job. These are people who may have endorsed some of these beliefs uh, about themselves and about others for 10, 15 years, and it may be an uphill battle to try to convince them otherwise. And I'll just say one more thing. So in partnership with, with Barbie and Lisa and her team, uh, we're grateful for the support. We've turned to another aspect that's concerning about current society, which is the gender gap in um, leadership and political leadership and leadership more generally. Like, and this, is, this came up in Lisa's um, uh, personal narrative as well, right? Um, so what, what 
is it that makes it more difficult for, for women to um, sort of see themselves in, in leadership positions? And of course, part of it is the bias that others around them exhibit against women in leadership positions. But there's also a sense in which uh, girls growing up might not see those positions as being for themselves. And we wanted to understand like what are some of the, the biases that emerge along the way that, that lead them to think that. And one of the things that we discovered is that pretty early on, again, starting at the age of six and seven, girls expect people who step up to be in charge, to, to, uh, to lead, to suffer social backlash, to be less liked, to be thought of bossy, to be thought of less nice. And that was something that girls thought, but boys didn't think, which reflects the fact that they're, girls are really socialized in quite a different way uh, than, than boys are. When boys do these things, they're not penalized, they're not punished, they're not told that's not something you're supposed to do, but girls are, and they expect this kind of leadership behavior to be penalized by others by um, uh, be for, by uh, having them be less likely to be your friends to uh, making you less likable, right? And, and that relates in turn with girls' aspirations in the studies that we've done um, and seems like a, a major concern um, that parents and teachers and educators should be um, made aware of. And I guess that's, that's also talking to the public about some of these research findings, both past and, and present is one of the ways in which we try to raise awareness about these issues because a lot of people that we speak to don't even have a notion that a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a seven-year-old would have sort of picked up on some of these uh, beliefs from the culture around them. Agreed, agreed, and thanks for sharing. Um, so I guess my question to Kat then as a good transition, and when we think about gender parity, we must consider the intersectional experiences of young women who come from different cultural backgrounds, family structures, socioeconomical statures, um, gender identities, right? Um, can you talk about the importance of approaching um, gender parity from an intersectional field? Yeah, totally. Um, so I minored in critical race theory in college, which is a controversial phrase these days, I know. Um, and I am an anti-racist and abolitionist. Um, and I, I firmly believe that colorblind feminism um, is harmful. So to give you an example of how um, we often hear about the wage gap and that women make 83 cents to a man's dollar. But if you focus on, for example, Latina women, it's 57 cents to a white man's dollar. It's 64 cents for black women. So the conversation around the wage gap is completely centered on white women, but they're not the ones who are suffering most from wage inequality, um, which doesn't make any sense. Or like, you know, we can talk about this. This applies to so many other statistics. Like if you look at, you know, some of the most vulnerable members of our society, for example, the average life expectancy of a black trans woman, I believe, is 35 years, which is abominable. Um, so if we don't look at people who are not just women, but who are who have all these other intersecting issues that are preventing them from advancing, um, we lose a lot of people. Um, and it's a, it's a matter of life and death in a lot of cases. Um, people die because they're neglected by society and by the state. Um, and if you care about fem feminism, I think you have to care about all women, not just the people who are sort of closer to the top. Um, with regards to sort of how that relates to my uh, work with girls right now, um, my bakong, so my mother's uh, grandfather, he worked in a laundromat, and then my mom uh, worked in like a sweatshop as a kid, like making sense, uh, pants for 10 cents, I think, a pair of pants was what she was paid, and like my paternal grandfather was a security guard, so like I said, I had no idea what IP even was. So this stereotype that immigrants want their kids to be doctors and lawyers, it has some truth to it because those are obvious paths to success for people who are working jobs that are menial labor. They don't really know what, like they know, okay, a doctor makes a lot of money. I'm, I sacrificed everything to get you here. I'm going to send you to college. And this is something that I know will be a good return on my investment. Right. Um, but of course there are all these other paths to success that people have never even heard of. So through programs like girls right now, um, these young women or gender expansive teens are able to see futures that they might not otherwise be exposed to. I had a friend who'd been doing her taxes uh, for her parents since she was 12 because they didn't understand English documents. Um, and, you know, she's a pro in negotiating with the various and sundry social service offices in the city. And so her parents are like, oh, you should go to business school. But there are all these other different things that she could do. You know, she could go into 
grant writing, she could go into financial journalism, she could be a financial analyst. There are all these things that, you know, for a lot of these kids who come from um, communities or families where their, their, their idea of what their future can be is very limited. The fewer paths they see to success, the less likely they are to succeed. And the more options that you have, the more things that you can try, the more likely you are to find something that not just that you can do, you know, not just that you're like, okay, I can go and get the degree, I can get an A and then I can succeed at this job. It's something that you actually care about, which makes you more successful to advance in your field. Um, which is certainly true for me. I mean, I've worked a lot of jobs at this point that I didn't really want to do. I thought I wanted to teach for a while and then I didn't like being restricted by all the state rules about what I could and couldn't tell kids. And I tried working um, in television and film for a while and I, I bounced around a lot and I finally found this job and I really, really love what I do, but it took a long time. And I don't regret it necessarily, but at this point now, I'm older than a lot of people are in my position. And I am several years back with regards to my career because it take, took me a long time to sort of get to where I wanted to be. And I think if I'd had more education and access to sort of thinking about what I could be, um, maybe that wouldn't be true. I love that. I love that. Thanks for sharing. Um, so let me just jump to Miriam because I want to hear you a little bit more. Um, how do you see role models impacting um, girls in the coming years? Um, where do you think there, there's opportunity to evolve how we utilize role models to um, inspire girls? Well, perhaps I should start by saying that I do hope that we see many female role models this, of every background continuing trying to have access yeah. to girls. And to me, the, the persistence and persevering in doing that is really important because we do know that we get amazing change in children when we expose them to role models. You know, some of the girls, for example, who come to our sessions and our workshops, 90% of them say that they have discovered new jobs and possibilities that they didn't know beforehand. And you could, you know, you don't even need very sophisticated research for that. You come to those events and you ask them, what do you want to be? And the things that they tell you are still traditional jobs. And you say, well, you know, th these are not even the jobs of today. So how come we have that gap? But it takes at least three interventions of role models to be able to have some impact in a little girl. So it is not just about doing a one-off, it's about making sure that we all continue doing it on a, recurrent, on a recurrent basis. For me, one of the trends, and I have observed that myself in the, you know, I have been for nine years now, dedicating all my free time to women and girls. And what I have seen already in those nine years is that we have all become much more aware of how we need to start earlier. We started on the, 13, 14, 15, and then we went to the oh, 10, 11, 12. And now I'm thinking, no, 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 let's go to the 7, 8, 9. And I think that it is very true what Andre was saying that from age six, and the OECD has done also really good complementary research in the, in the PISA analysis that they do every uh, year, that it is really from six that they start looking at the world differently. And it goes to really perverse levels. You know, sometimes you put a man there and you say, well, what job do you think that this person has? And they say, boss. I said, well, boss, what kind of boss? <laughs> you know, but they never say that when they are talking about a, a woman. But something that kicks in even earlier, and it would be great to hear your views, Andre, if we have time later on or offline, is the fear of failure. So they are measuring that the fear of failure is much bigger in girls than boys. And that already starts from age five. So our interventions need to be earlier on. In terms of the trends, I think that we are going to see more diversity. What I have observed is that that message of you know, role models need to be diverse and they need to come from a variety of backgrounds and a variety of positions and also a variety of levels. In our workshops and events, you know, it's often not the really well-known, hyper-successful woman who has an impact. It's a woman who is starting and the girls can really relate to her. So I think that we are going to see more of that. I think that we are going to see more authentic role models. We have, let's face it, over the last few years, especially at the top level, we have seen lots of women for whom 
being a role model was almost like a branding, a pink wash branding. I think that very quickly we are seeing that, you know, what girls really want to see is the real you and the difficulties and how you step up when it, it wasn't obvious that you would do that. So I think that we will see more of that. And, and the last and the third, which is an obsession, a personal obsession of mine, is easier access. You know, we keep going, where are the girls? <laughs> so if the girls are in the schools, let's go to schools. If they are online, let's go online. Let's try to make it that they don't even have to click the computer. So let's go to their feeds in social media. And wherever they are in the metaverse, we will be in the metaverse working with them. So, so easy access to me is one of the keys of the success in this work. Definitely, I agree with you there. Um, so now I have a question to Lisa. Um, you mentioned previously Barbie's mission to close the dream gap and helping girls believe that they can be anything um, is largely supported by inclusive products and highlighting role models. Um, looking forward, what trends or themes do you see coming to advance the careers of women and girls around the world? Well, one theme that I'm, I'm really intrigued by, um, and it sort of bridges to leadership, is, um, you know, in the past two years, there have been a lot of studies about companies and who's been successful, who hasn't, what have been the keys to those leaders' success, et cetera. And the attribute of empathy has come up as a topic. You know, there's, we've seen that that um, skill and that ability to um, appreciate what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes has really helped um, a lot of leaders weather these difficult times, you know, especially as we've all been under incredible pressure these past few years. And what I'm excited about is we did some interesting research with Cardiff University in the UK. And um, we found regardless of gender um, and regardless of, of playing with a friend or playing with yourself um, by, by yourself, when children play with dolls, it unlocks empathy. So there's this interesting benefit of doll play that um, you know, serves certainly girls, but also boys. And I'm intrigued by that. So I, that's sort of a trend we're following and wondering what more we can glean um, from that. Um, we know it plays an important role in um, you know, predicting kids' well-being. Um, as they grow up. And, you know, we hope it's a, an attribute that can help them become future leaders. Other trends, of course, Miriam touched on this, you know, and Kat as well. I mean, you know, we absolutely need to make sure when we're highlighting and using our brand to amplify role models that we're conscious about intersectionality, um, that we're conscious about the barriers and the challenges, and we're not just celebrating the triumphs in our storytelling. So we're trying to put a finer point on all the programming that we're doing. Um, and then of course, we've talked a lot about digital access and um, digital exposure and STEM careers. And again, Barbie has celebrated about 30 STEM careers in recent years, but we've got more to do there too. Um, we've got partnerships with Black Girls Who Code. We've worked with Microsoft. We have a coding uh, curriculum that we developed with Tinker which is pretty cool um, to make it again, fun and relatable to, to kids. But again, more that we can do there as well. So those are some of the themes and trends that I'm excited about. Awesome. So then can you share a call to action for other brands who can join you in doing the work of closing the dream gap? Well, it's just that, I mean, I'm, I'm here today to, to continue to spread the word. You know, uh, yeah. we've been on a journey since 2018 to raise consciousness about the dream gap. Um, now we're trying to obviously take more action. Um, we can't do it alone. Barbie cannot be everywhere. And we're certainly not an expert in all these different fields. Um, so we need partners to help, um, you know, use their tools, their curriculum, their, their access to help girls get the tools they need to overcome the obstacles and, you know, overcome the dream gap. Thank you. 
And for everybody, thank you so much for joining us today as we explored the importance of role models and breaking the gender bias and achieving gender parity. Panelists, thank you so much for all that you contributed. I'm grateful to have been part of this amazing conversation and moderating. Uh, for everyone, please check out the Dream Gap Project website linked in the description and see Barbie's ongoing initiatives that gives girls resources and support that they need to continue believing in themselves and being those boss ass girls <laughs> that they could definitely be. Um, so definitely help us with this narrative. Thank you, Barbie, the Female Potion for organizing this incredible conversation and bringing this group of leaders together. It's empowerful and empowering. So thank you all. <laughs>